classic section member, or else, after that. Um, I'll sign off very quickly as uh, there are other things to come, of course. Events, we have, um, just recently we had a Gardens and Garages and it was an excellent day and thank you to uh, the other sections who supported it so well. We had uh, in excess of 60 people and the cars on display were fantastic and I speak of uh, the Betts Maserati and Ferrari SS100 Jaguar, uh, modern Jaguar and a couple of Alphas in the, in the restoration as well as... Uh, Members and friends again, I'd like to introduce Norm Beachy to you. Norm's been around for a long time. He made an attempt at motor racing back at the 1958 Albert Park meeting. A bit disenchanted and he went home and gave a few uh, rethinks. Came out and uh, challenged Len Lukey in the uh, custom line that he had at the time. And uh, from then on he vowed and declared that he could beat anybody on the road. Uh, he took up that challenge and made a very successful entry into showing Bob Jane around the tracks and a few of the other notables. Apart from that, he also developed into a very successful businessman, uh, operating a number of uh, the sports stores around Melbourne. Probably one of the first to start and introduce the specialist hardware to go on the cars. And uh, from there, of course, he finished up into the trucking business and uh, possibly one of the most successful uh, con men in Australia <laughs> uh, the business. But um, Norm went out in a flurry, he was originally a member of the Neptune racing team uh, comprising Peter Mann and Jim McEwen and they toured the country. On many occasions they came to Malala and unlike the professionals of the day that uh, are holier than now. At least Norm always showed up and uh, did challenge with uh, the likes of Clem Smith who bought him tea tonight. And um, the fact of the matter was at that stage it was still a sport. And I think that uh, Norm's got a better story to tell us. We've got a tape. And I'd like you to give Norm Beachy a welcome, please. <laughs> speaking with a very keen batch of enthusiasts. South Australia to us in, in my motor racing career has a very soft spot. Uh, we've always been looked after exceptionally well over here, particularly by Clem Smith who used to throw open his workshop to us uh, every time we came. And I asked Clem one evening why he did it as well. Uh, we've always got along splendidly, but he, he really it was a, a gift from Clem to the Sporting Car Club uh, so as we could all make sure our cars were all running ready for the meeting. We must have driven your neighbours mad, Clem, that lived out there when we were uh, settling in solar heads in the middle of the night with it running, and, uh, and uh, I'm not too sure, but I think we used to get a few things on the roof out there occasionally, thrown up by the neighbours. Anyhow, this evening, uh, I'll just pop out and speak for about half an hour. I'll condense uh, 18 and 19 years of motor racing into a bit of, bit of a squeeze, but uh, I do have with me a very excellent film, which was made in 1970, was made by the Shell Oil Company and we had five uh, photographers follow us for the year when I raced my 350 Monaro and fortunately I won the championship in that year. Uh, if I hadn't have won it, they had a backup. Bob Jane was also sponsored by Shell in that year. But uh, really it's a splendid film. It's uh, one of the, uh, it's got a series of seven meetings. Uh, I think at that stage it only be going for two years <coughs> and um, it has a splendid shot unfortunately or fortunately of um, uh, uh, Pete Deegan running into the side or T-boning is the word I think into Moffat at Warwick Farm and it's got some other uh, very spectacular scenes on it and it's put together a little bit like a French movie it has flashes backwards and forwards and it's a little hard to follow in spots but it's a, it, by and large it's a very excellent film. Okay, um, I suppose really what my career started uh, I, I raced uh, a 1955 a new overhead valve Ford custom line at, at Albert Park in the 1956 Olympic Grand Prix meeting and uh, 
touring car racing or sedan car racing probably is what it was called in those days. Uh, we uh, uh, were not very experienced at it. Uh, I mean, I was very fortunate in that particular race uh, to win my first race against the top established stars of the day, which was Len Lukey. Uh, Bob Holden was racing a Ripco Holden. And um, it, I, I was very fortunate, um, and I had a lot of practice driving around the country. At that particular stage, I was a, a plain used car dealer. And I used to do an enormous amount of racing, uh, running around the countryside at high speeds in those days on dirt roads. And, and when I got near a, a, a bit of bitumen and things, about, uh, my, my, my technique was pretty good because, it, as you know here, the country people here, that if you slip off into the table, drain yourself, or slip on the gravel, it uh, can really knock things about. But, so it was very good. It certainly established myself in motor racing. It, it, it uh, made me very keen to proceed. All in all, in almost 20 years of racing, I raced 27 different motor cars, uh, all saloon cars. And uh, to a lot of people here, that sort of when you sort of think back a few years, you get back on the first six or seven. But um, I did, in fact, race four Ford Custom Lines. And um, and when you start adding them up, it's just surprising how they do add up. The uh, I, I, at that stage, I was just using my ordinary 55 Ford. We, we, we'd, put, we'd put twin car operators on it, not much else. And um, uh, I was using it as a road car as well. The following year, I went back with another Ford Custom Line, expecting to repeat the effort at Albert Park. But uh, on that particular meeting, uh, I had a, a tangle and a crash uh, with the Lukey car, which had been sold to a chap named Owen Bailey. And uh, the following weekend, we, we uh, straightened the car. It wasn't badly bent. Bailey's unfortunately was, and uh, I, I finished up fourth in the touring car race in that particular event, and Clem uh, Smith finished up third in his Repco uh, Red uh, Holden Sand uh, in that particular event. I was fortunate enough to uh, take over an entry in that particular uh, outing. I raced under the name of Basil Rice in the first event in 55, and uh, it's just an entry I took over, and so in the, in the, in the winning program for that particular thing, uh, the name Basil Rice appears. <laughs> we, we, we had plenty of practice uh, racing our Fords around the street in Brunswick. Uh, Bobby Jane and I lived very close to each other. We're still very good friends, and uh, and uh, we were sort of uh, a pretty arrogant little bunch. We were myself and, and Bob, and uh, and um, I proceeded down the road in business, and so was Bob, and uh, we, we've uh, been very good friends all that time. In 1958. Uh, the Jaguars appeared, or 59, I think it was 58, uh, at Albert Park, and it, it revolutionised touring car racing as we knew it. At that stage, the, uh, the Fords had been pretty dominant, and then along came the Repco Holdens, which were uh, very excellent as well in, in their day. And uh, I remember, uh, I haven't seen David Mackay for a few years, but I remember him distinctly. He was down at Phillip Island, and he had his handkerchief out, and he was actually knocking the dust off the car and he said, um, I must keep the works Jaguar clean, Norman. Um, <laughs> and, and really, he, he just uh, hopped in that lovely car and zoomed, zoomed away for us and, and uh, nothing beat a Jag uh, probably in this country for about five years, I'd say. There were quite a number of Jags racing, to a few people that don't know them, I'd say the number eventually got up to probably about five. It was Bill Pitt in Queensland, uh, the Gagans finished up uh, uh, with a car. Uh, of course, Bob Jane's very, very famous 3.8, and Bill Burns in Sydney uh, had a red one, and Ron, Ron Hodson had one. So, all in all, there was quite a clutch of them at racing, and uh, they dominated for probably about a five to six year period. In 1960, <coughs> I had my first fully sponsored drive, and I thought I'd made it. I was uh, contracted um, in 60 to drive a Ford. Uh, 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 drive for AMI Industries. I, I drove a Vanguard at Phillip Island. <laughs> and, uh, it was brand new. I, I, I was paid. They bought me a nylon shirt as well. <laughs> and, and they, they paid the accommodation. They also also they, they, they paid us to drive the car. I was fortunate enough to talk uh, uh, um, one of my very good friends up, up in Brisbane to come down, John. John uh, to, to come and drive the car with us, and uh, uh, we had, had a pretty fine time in that car, but the most fortunate thing that happened to me was that um, uh, the team leader was Harry Firth of the AMI team. They also had um, three, two tri Triumph Heralds, which were splendid little cars on the racetrack with their independent suspension, and uh, 
Harry first got hold of me in 60, and um, he taught me uh, a considerable amount of, of getting through corners and getting out of corners and sort of trying to keep the wheel straight on the car. And uh, um, I had some I had some very rough edges on me as, uh, getting around the track fast in 1960, and Harry Firth did, did wonders for me. It was really splendid. John French was my co-driver, by the way. Um, I actually had the misfortune to tip the vanguard over uh, in practice. <laughs> And um, I, I thought when you drove for a motor company, I, I never dreamt that they'd panel beat the car out and give it back to me and say, hop back in this car. I, I thought you'd just get another new car and uh, it'd be all, all like that. I thought, you know, van guys weren't that easy to sell me then. <laughs> so any, anyhow, I, I hopped in the car and, and after I tipped it over, uh, I had all the uh, mechanics lined up there and uh, they were all looking at me and, uh, and I got out of the car and I said, look, the steering seized up on the, on the car and I just went straight ahead and it tipped over at the end of the main straight at Phillip Island. So anyhow, they panel beat the car, give it back to me and I wasn't very courageous in the car at this particular stage and eventually I worked my lap times down a bit and lo and behold, the damn steering locked up again and I very nearly tipped the car over again. So I came back and the mechanic swarmed all over the car and uh, couldn't find a thing wrong with the car. Uh, and, and here's this driver who's tipped over once, nearly tipped over again, saying the steering locked up. It turned out, so you guys here, the mechanically minded, that most of you would be, in those days the tyre ends had very large bolts in them, left and right hand threads, and in, and in near the chassis, uh, when the bolts stuck up and everything weaved and twisted, the end of the bolt was biting into the chassis. It was only just a matter of turning the, the track rod down, down a spit and cleared that I had actually pulled a piece out of the chassis. They were very thin in those days. Just a little sort of overflap. So I felt a bit exonerated, but I certainly felt a bit of a fool there for a while. <laughs> One of my great memories uh, when I first started racing full-time in, in my old Holden was that Warwick Farm opened up and, uh, excuse me, we loaded a spare short motor gearbox into the boot of the, my old black Holden drove it to Warwick Farm, beat all the existing Holdens that were racing at the time, and, and, and also David Mackay was in a new Fiat, uh, beat them nicely, reloaded the boot and drove the car home. And uh, these days I'm probably back to about where I started them. Doing half. <laughs> not, not, not beating too many, but I'm doing half about the same thing with this one. Uh, it was really a good memory for us, and, and Jeff Sykes that ran Warwick Farm uh, was just splendid to us. He, he really was... Uh, um, very saloon oriented, which was surprising because you know he put on some very fine open wheel racing, but he was certainly uh, splendid to us. You know, I tipped over my old Holden at uh, Cold in a very spectacular fashion, and I'd, I'd uh, approached the Shell Oil Company um, and uh, and uh, talked them into running a team of uh, uh, saloon cars, which we, we didn't have a touring car team in those days in Australia. And Shell uh, picked it all up, and um, it, 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 uh, the team went splendidly. And uh, I, I just overturned the car. I went home that evening. I had a splendid handling motor car, and I gave it another half a degree of negative on the front steering that night without testing it. And I turned a splendid handling old Holden into a horrible car to drive. It was just sticking on the front end, and I was in a very tense race with Bobby Jane, and had a new Fiat. You know, I think a Fiat was a 2600 with a four-speed gearbox and a few things, and uh, I just simply. Uh, did the sin of motor racing, it made, made an older racing that I didn't test, you know. Um, just, I, I jumped a little bit there for the Neptune team, but to sort of, just to fill in a little bit on this car, I, I had a boyhood dream in sort of 61 uh, or 62, uh, didn't have a lot of money, and I sort of had the, the dream that, I, that I'd like to emulate that Dan Gurney raced a 61 one of these cars, a 61 two-door. In 61 they only had a single carburetor, in 62 they came with two four-barrel carburetors, You've always, you ordered them with a four-speed gearbox and a limit slip diff. And uh, I thought that I'd like to win the rain, or I felt I could beat the Jaguars uh, with, with an American car. Well, I certainly did beat the Jaguars. And on reflection over the years, I, I should have gone and bought a Jaguar. It was just such a fine car uh, for, for motor racing. And um, uh, it, it would have been a, a wonderful thing to have had one. But anyhow, I, I did it in this car, and it took an immense amount of work. And uh, it won its first seven races, and uh, it wasn't ready for an Australian Touring Car Championship. It, it just missed out on the first one. And then I retired the car, and I had the offer from Lukey Mufflers to drive their lovely big Ford Galaxy, uh, and uh, it was all free of charge. And, and after picking up the bills, getting this monster to beat a Jaguar, uh, I really felt it was terrific to come walking down with the hat and then picking up all the, the bills. Lukey was a fine sponsor, and a great chap to drive for. And um, 
He had a special rev counter in the car, which uh, had a telltale tacker, and he used to lead in the car, take the key out of the tacker and say, don't rev it over seven, son. <laughs> and when you came back, it, 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 the telltale had to be whatever it was supposed to be at. Uh, but he certainly was, was a great sponsor, and the, the car was, uh, was an interesting car to drive. But uh, both this car and the Galaxy in that era had very poor four-speed gearboxes. Uh, the gearboxes are the, the same today, except that the gears were just too thin and they were very prone to stripping third gear, both cars. I won the uh, Victorian Touring Car Championship in that car in 62, and the New South Wales Touring Car Championship, and then in 63 I lost the Victoria Touring Car Championship by a, a length to Bobby Jane, his Jaguar, in the Galaxy, and I had no third gear in the Galaxy for the whole race that stripped in the first lap, and so I was just racing in top gear, but uh, it's amazing. Uh, when you settle down, just uh, how little you can use the gears and what decent times you can put in on certain circuits. Anyhow, getting back to the, uh, uh, and just by the way too, we couldn't get this car to run properly at that stage. It, 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 um, it seized the bearings three times in practice and uh, we wrote to Dan Gurney who had raced his car in England. He told us exactly what to do with the bearings. It was a problem in those days in this country. We had never given bearings so much side clearance on the conrods. It, it had something like 40,000 side clearance in total on the, th on the two rods per journal. And the oils in those days were not like they are today. And you had to use a huge amount of oil. You had to double the volume of the oil pump, four gears instead of two, and pour the oil through the bearings to keep the bearings cool. So when Gurney filled us in on that, uh, it, it, we got it moving. Getting back to the, uh, the Neptune team, um, Shell, or was Neptune, uh, being the Shell Oil Company, they, they picked us up. I formed the team and um, it, it was a sort of a, an excellent promotion. We, we did all the dealer sites, we went to the, the hospitals, we went to the television things. And it, was, uh, it was pretty weary, as I can imagine, even more so these days with the current uh, people involved in sponsorship. When you take on the sponsorship, you take on the responsibilities. I formed the original Neptune team with myself, Peter Mant in his mini and Harry Firth in his um, uh, Cortina Ford. And uh, Harry was at this stage most difficult to get along as far as Shell were concerned. Harry wanted a Neptune wanted the blue car, Harry wanted the red car, Harry wanted the Ford Motor Company written all over his car, <coughs> Neptune wanted the written all over the car. And, uh, anyway, in the end, it, uh, we, Harry never appeared at a, a meeting. We just uh, couldn't get to any compromise on it. And my delightful boss at the Shell Oil Company just said to me, oh, well, Norman, just go and find uh, someone to beat Harry Firth. So I you know. <laughs> now eventually uh, I, I found Jimmy McEwen, uh, just a country panel leader in, in, in Victoria, and with uh, Shell's assistance uh, uh, he bought a Lotus Cortina, which was the first one to race in this country, and he did in fact uh, um, speed around the tracks considerably faster than Harry in, in, in those days. It was, it was a great experience to us, and um, we, we were, and, and Shell were absolutely great sponsors. You know. Um, to anyone that the engineers that are here, I'll just briefly, uh, we, we, we went on, uh, at, at the time of my trip over my old Holden, I also debuted in the team at that particular stage, I debuted a new EH Holden S4, and I also had the, uh, the, the Lukey Galaxy uh, to use on the big open tracks like Sandown or, or Longford if it was on, or Queensland at Lowood. The Galaxy unfortunately proved to be uh, very fragile on the finish. It, uh, to beat Bobby James Jaguar, the, the engine used to go back to Holm and Moody in, in, in America, and it just would not hang together. In fact, uh, Len wanted to have uh, it blew up about three times in a row when we used it, just with broken conrods. And Len Lukey wanted the air freight back the motor and have another go. And I just said to him, I, just, I, I said I was getting nervous driving the car. Anyhow, we, we, we debuted uh, the, the whole team at, at Calder. Uh, I took the, uh, the old Holden over. And, first race, and my dear boss from the Shell Oil Company said to me, well Norman, uh, he said, uh, if you don't feel up to it, he said, uh, don't drive in the next race in the new S4. And I actually <laughs> said, well, I don't mind driving. I said, but if we bugger two cars in the one day, that'll be a bit of a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, the, the, the Holden proved to be a tremendously popular car of the fans, and um, it, it, uh, it set a new lap record at Calder on that opening meeting, and uh, it was no Jaguar beater, but... Uh, it uh, put in some splendid times, and as far as the, the oil company I, I drove for, Neptune, they were absolutely thrilled. And at the end of the year, they uh, just said to me, well, what have we got to do, Norm, to beat the Jaguar? And 
I sat looking up across the desk at my boss and Shell and myself, and I couldn't quite come to grips with the, what they actually meant was, well, uh, here's the checkbook, uh, go and get one to beat it. So uh, in those days it was pretty unusual, and I uh, went to America and uh, bought the Mustang with Shell's money, uh, with a proper Shelby racing engine and spare gearboxes and diffs and everything, and uh, I came back home with change out of $10,000. <laughs> but, uh, I suppose at that stage you could buy a house for two or three thousand. You know. I actually had the engine uh, built by Shelby's, and I took the head engine man down to the local hotel. And uh, this is true. <laughs> I slept him five hundred US dollars. We were having a beer, and I said, "Just make me the best engine you can." He said, "I'll look after it." Norm. <laughs> when, the, when the dyno sheet came out, it had written on the back of it. His name was Jack Hall. Uh, I bought the Mustang for 2,300 US dollars. The racing engine cost 2,950 US dollars. And on the bottom of the dyno sheet, it had not, uh, I think it gave at that stage about 396 horsepower. And on the bottom of the dyno sheet, not bad for a flat tap at can, the Jack Hall. Well, in those days in 64, out in Australia, I don't think any of us had heard of a roller cam. And eventually, when we pulled the, the engine to pieces, it had the first roller cam in it that I'd ever seen. So I think my $500 did very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, Must the Mustang certainly did end, end the Jaguar domination, and I, I was sitting on the mudguard of the car, cold or waiting to have a start. Bobby Jane said, "If you're not really worried, are you, Buff?" I said, "No, no, 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 no. But uh, Bob, Bob had had a fair indication. The Jaguar had a wonderful career, and um, my Mustang was the first Mustang to race in the world uh, to win a race. And then, of course, as you probably all know, uh, there, there was really quite a, a fleet of them arrived." And uh, we, we were lucky enough to win the Australian Championship, which in those days it all hung on one meeting, which was pretty awkward if your car failed at that one meeting. But we, we did win at Sandown. We came off the back of the grid. We'd had uh, we'd actually the tail shaft had flown to pieces. It was a single piece tail shaft, Mustangs, and that, and that, uh, that we finished up. We couldn't seem to run it properly. It, it, we had vibration problems, and we made it over. over the evening we turned into a two piece tail shaft, had to all balance the rip going the car went splendidly on that day. Mm. My bosses at the Shell Oil Company were very, very keen. I was always in the middle of the development <coughs> program. Uh, every year they wanted me to try and think up a car or arrive with a car uh, and, and with their funds uh, to try and bring the, 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 the fans back into the area every, every year. And henceforth we changed colours a lot on the car. And, and we changed cars a lot. I went to America in uh, late in 65 to replace the buy a car to replace the Mustang, and I'd actually decided that the car I liked was a, a 427 cubic inch two-door Ford Fairlane, a 66 model. And I sat in the office of Jacques Passano, who was the boss of Ford Motor Racing uh, in the USA, or World Racing in those days. And I said to him, but is the car homologated? He said, normally, he said, we can give you a set of homologation papers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, but is it really homologated? And he said, oh, well, you know. Oh, and I said, I don't know about that. He said, well, if you don't buy one, Norm, he said, Bobby Jane will buy one, he'll beat you. <laughs> <laughs> so I never did, never did buy the Ford, but uh, one went to New Zealand and did very well. We never had one into this country, but the big engines in those days after Lukey's car they're giving so much problems at about that time, you know, they're getting ready to go to Le Mans and they'd made beautiful Conrods for the car and, and even, um, uh, it, it would have been a very splendid car, but it, it just wasn't a Molligo. I finished up uh, buying my Chevy Nova uh, to run in 66 and it was just a splendid motor car. It, it, uh, it should have looked in the record books a lot better than um, it just never featured, it, never, it did, never did win an Australian Championship. I debuted the car at Bathurst. I'd never been to Bathurst in 66. I get asked the question sometimes when I'm at a car club. They say, oh, things have changed, Mr. Beachy, since you raced. I said, yes, they certainly have. I said, I remember doing 167 mile an hour at Bathurst in 66 down the straight. I said, I was sitting in a nylon sh shirt on a bench seat with drum brakes <laughs> and no roll bar. So I like to say, they certainly have changed. <laughs> but I, but I, I took the over to Bathurst and it was just miles in front and unfortunately we were running a new aluminium clutch flywheel on at the time. The clutch slipped and the car was just so far in front in 66 that uh, you, you could have uh, got the tea lady to drive I think. 
Unfortunately, a similar thing happened to me in 67. I was still driving the car and uh, I blew a rear tyre. We we'd made a poor choice, obviously, of tyre compounds and I was comfortably in front of the lakeside again and uh, I just obviously put too much wear into the rear tyres and, and we, we blew a tyre about six laps from home after leading comfortably. He won a lot of uh, state championships the car and uh, it was just a splendid little car. It only had nine and a half inch drum brakes but we ran metal to metal brakes on it and then we had Buick brake drums on the front of it which were well finned and things and Buick brake drums on the back of it and um, it really was, uh, it was a pretty plain Jane little car but uh, it weighed the lightest you could imagine and it had nearly 500 horsepower. It was quite a ride. I had the engine made by the, uh, the people in Los Angeles, Traco and uh, it ran the 58 crossover weavers and uh, it really was uh, quite a setup. And fortunately when I, when I crashed in 67 at Lakeside, I, I hit the fence right in front of my sponsors. They're, they're all sitting up there. I think floating might have been one of good, been a good word. And, and, and then I hit the fence and it was right in front of, at the Shell Tower, which is the, the, at the back of the circuit. For 1968, we bought a, a new Chef Camaro. And on reflection, I probably should have kept the car. But I was approached by General Motors. I only used the car probably about four times. I debuted it colder and it went splendidly. And um, we took the lap record with the car at uh, Warwick Farm. And it, it was showing enormous potential. It was a 350 cubic inch in 68. It had a, 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 later on in the year it came with full rear disc brakes and everything and uh, it really would have been a great car. I was approached by General Motors to race their uh, Holden Monaro 327 uh, with some sensible financial assistance from them, and a free car of course and uh, a few other things and uh, I decided to hop into the Holden. It was a terribly popular car as the EH had been popular but I don't think there was one part of it that didn't fall off. <laughs> and uh, it just, uh, I, I could spend an hour telling you, you uh, what broke, but uh, it just, we had to remake the car. And when you were continually involved in a development program like I, I was trying to make the so many different cars uh, get to the front and be successful, uh, the whole was really quite a problem. I was racing against Trans Am cars which had huge tyres, huge wheel arches and things, and. Uh, and uh, I was probably complaining heavily to CAMS, who were obviously uh, listening. And in 1970, they, they permitted uh, myself and the local car. I moved on to another General Motors car, uh, the same Holman Arrow, but a 350. And that particular year, we were allowed to do similar things that the Trans Am cars have done. And we got uh, wider tyres, wider wheel arches, and, uh, and um, we, we had a splendid year winning, winning the championship. It was a huge year. Um, a lot of hard work, uh, we were very dedicated, I had three or four very keen mechanics that worked on the car tirelessly and uh, one of my mechanics uh, when I stopped racing went and worked, Louis Mellia, went and worked for Moffat for about four years and um, we, we turned an old Australian car into, into a Trans Am at Beta. By this time of course we had a pile of Trans Ams in this country with Moffat's lovely car, uh, uh, the Ford company had given Bobby Jane a car, uh, Greg Cusack had, had one, the Gagans had one, and um, how we ever got a local car to beat those cars was, was quite a feat because uh, the Trans Am ca Trans cars had so much suspension work put into them in the front angles and the rear, rear angles, and then they were really fine motor cars. We, um, uh, we were fortunate enough to win the Australian Championship in the car, and uh, and, um, excuse me, but we were made the offer to take our car to Pukekohe, which is in Auckland, New Zealand, for the international meeting uh, uh, just after Christmas. And uh, the, um, uh, Ron Frost over there, who's still with uh, the, the, the Mance, I think it's called over there, that run uh, racing in, in New Zealand, I just said to him, look, it's not a matter of money, we've just, we've just had such a, 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 a tiring year or, or, or a tough year that uh, we, we just really, really didn't want to go. And, and as, it turned, as it turned out, uh, uh, the offer became so ridiculously, excellently financially, we just decided to go and do it for the money. <laughs> no, no, we really, we wanted the holiday, we were worn out, and uh, it, it 
just got to a stage where it was just uh, you just had to go and do it. So we, we took the opportunity of um, getting our dry sump to work. We went to New Zealand. We were there a couple of weeks before. We did a lot of promotions. And uh, we went to the speedway with the car. We went to the banks and put it in the foyers. We did everything. And uh, and uh, I was sitting down in the office with, with Ron Frost. And he said, you know, Norm, all the international cars were there from overseas. And he said, you know, Norman, he said, you're our highest paid driver. Well, I said, I find that a bit hard to believe, Ron. He said, no, it's true. He said, uh, he said, there's the list of what we're paying everybody. I said, oh, don't give me that list. I said, I'm such an old gossip, you know, that I, I'll tell everyone how much money I'm getting because I was very proud as a touring car driver uh, to be uh, so well paid uh, at, for a 10-lap race uh, at an international meeting. Because normally as a touring car driver, um, when you have an international meeting on with all the overseas chaps, uh, the, the touring car side of it uh, never really got much emphasis. Oh, no, he said, he said, it's a club over here. He said, everyone knows what we've offered you and we're paying you. He said, to, you just take the sheet and keep it as a memento. And I said, oh, that's nice. So while well, I'm walking down through the pits, and I run into David Mackay, who was uh, racing uh, uh, heavily at those times in the Ferrari, and David started a little. And he said to me, Norman, I believe you're the, the highest paid driver here. And I said, that's right. He said, no, but bloody old touring car. <laughs> so anyhow, anyhow, we... They asked me to make a race of it because uh, there, there were a few times that uh, we would make a race of bits and pieces and I just said to them, look, I said, I've just worked like a beaver for the whole year to win the Australian Championship. And I said, there was no way now and Paul Fay was one of their top drivers there and they wanted me to mix it up with him. I said, hang on, I said, I'm going to give you a demonstration of the 10 laps, not a, not a, not a, not a, not a mix-up, you know. And so we won very comfortably and set a new lap record and uh, we showed them what uh, it was to, you know, to attack an Australian winning uh, car. We were very pleased with it. We did a bit of racing uh, for Chrysler over here, um, who were very good sponsors. John Ellis was running the team here at the time, and we were well paid by Chrysler, and they, they supplied everything, like all the accommodation, the bits of transport, and uh, they were great sponsors. It was very hard um, to win a sort of a, a main race like Bathurst. Uh, uh, you really needed a Ford in those days or a Holden, and uh, I couldn't get a Holden because Peter Bock was doing that end of it for General Motors, and I was doing the, the improved touring cars. And uh, in the six-cylinder Valley, although it was a splendid car, beautifully sorted, and it just didn't quite have enough grunt to do the job. But uh, they were great sponsors. We introduced from South Australia uh, again. We, we were sponsored. We brought a new sponsor into, into Motor Racing Australia, which was ROH Holdings, Ruby Owen Holdings who made special wheels for us, paid us handsomely, and, and, and they also were fine sponsors that we were pleased to, to be involved with. I picked up the telephone in 1972 and rang the managing director of the Ford Motor Company, who I'd got to know over the years, and, uh, and um, he supplied me with a GDHO Falcon, which I only drove twice. Again, the, the contract was signed, uh, they, they paid me very well, and um, Alan Moffat screamed that hard, they actually had to dispense with my services. <laughs> and, uh, it was just, uh, it was just uh, we were certainly not acceptable on the, on the same company together. I was struggling about that time, about 72, I needed a new hold. I'd been doing it for years, and, and I, I just probably was sick of it. And um, I just looked at my age, and I, and I thought it was time I retired. It was getting very hard to sort of try and run a business full time. It was you know, pretty. Uh, professional, and that the professional racing drivers had arrived, you know, doing practice all through the weeks, and I could just see that uh, we, we just couldn't do the job that the professional guys could do. I uh, ran my Monaro and won the West Australian Touring Car Championship, uh, jumped in a helicopter, went home and uh, sold all the bits and pieces and went to work. I had some fine mechanics that worked for me, which probably the names would mean very little to people over here, but uh, one of them was Claude Morton, the other was Jack Wilson, Lou Mallier. John Shepard worked for me for a time, that worked for Gagans, Graham Moore, and Adrian Dalton. Ronnie Harrop, who's very famous in the, the, the touring car world these days, I think did his apprenticeship with us. And he was a great worker, he loved working all night. It was handy. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, we had some fine sponsors and uh, we, we were quite enjoying ourselves just messing around with this. Uh, I'm not competitive these days. Um, I mean, uh, my wife navigates me uh, in, in, in some of the classic rallies. We have a fine time. And, um, and if I complain to her, which I'm sure I don't, about her navigating at any stage, <laughs> I think she'd, she'd throw the, the books or the maps out the window and say, well, do it your bloody self. <laughs> so uh, we're just, uh, 
thoroughly enjoying the light side of, uh, of motorsport these days, and uh, we've, we've uh, enjoyed coming over here to the meeting. Now, I'll answer any questions at all after you see this film. If, uh, if any of you can think of anything you'd like to uh, throw any questions at me, I don't be too pleased. If this film will run for about 23 minutes, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. as a highlight of your career? Well, I think winning the, the championship film there, um, uh, I couldn't, uh, there'd be another hour's talk, uh, I told you just how much work we had to modify that car for, to do that job. And uh, I found out years later that, um, uh, say Moffat, for instance, he had that beautiful Bud Moore Mustang and uh, it should have rocked that uh, series in at the time. Uh, Bobby Jane had a wonderful car. Uh, which, you know, obviously, his mechanics were presenting with a with a poor car, but obviously that was the you know the, the, the highlight of my career. I would have thought, you know, it was pretty pleasing. Just one over here. As a spectator, a young fella at the track, I remember seeing you from the days of the S4 Holden up here in Melbourne and a few other places, but I never ever saw you looking so professional and worried. As you've already alluded to it tonight that when you got into those uh, 327, 350 Monaros, when you turned up the track riding most things. You look serious. Yeah, but, yeah, all the other times, you look as though you're out there enjoy, really enjoying it. But this goes to show you what money will do, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you now, a win in front of head office, like at Sandown, when that car on that particular shot won comfortably at Sandown. At Sandown, the, the non motor racing uh, general motors used to always go to the meeting, all the, all the managing directors. The Ford Motor Company would come to the meeting at Sandown. Uh, the Shell Oil Company, the managing director of the Shell Oil Company, would come. He could win three bloody races elsewhere, and, that, and one race at Sandown was better than all of them. Right? <laughs> sure. Uh, just, just to remind you uh, regarding that uh, Hillman Imp that you had, at uh, that particular time at the Colling Road, you and Greg McEwen, you were both dicing for the fastest time, and you were the first two blokes that beat 40 seconds for a saloon car. Uh -huh. Well, it's taken me a long while to get back to where I was 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a 
Dave, if I might, please. I want to bring Alan Marks up now just to uh, give a vote of thanks on behalf of the club. And then I've got something for you to do after that. <laughs> Mr. President, Mr. and Mrs. Beachy, ladies and gentlemen, Mark, I want to bring you into it just for a moment because a, a number of us know that you have on two occasions successfully navigated Norm around a Grand Prix rally course and uh, your training showed out tonight by successfully getting Norm to the SCC and we're very pleased about that. <laughs> But for a man with such a sporting career to stand up here and very proudly say I raced a Vanguard. <laughs> <laughs> then we see him give his mechanic two kisses. <laughs> Lord, Norm, I'm starting to worry about you. <laughs> but we've heard a lot tonight about... <laughs> we've, we've heard a lot tonight about Norm Beachy, the, the racing driver. If I could just tell you a very short story about Norm Beachy, the gentleman, and I mean gentleman in every sense of the word. Back in his Neptune days, Norm was parked on West Terrace one day, over here from Malala season, and uh, my older brother was over, and he's been a motorman for his entire life, and absolutely idolised not only Norm, but the whole of the team. And you must remember that they were absolute stars in their day, and Kev went over, and he's looking at Norm's car, and along came this guy, held his hand out, and said, uh, hello there, I'm Norm Beachy, who are you? Now reflect on that, and can you see Alan Jones doing that? Or <laughs> Alan Moffat? <laughs> Any of the modern guys? <laughs> sure, if there's a television camera there, they all do it. But there was no camera on Norm that day. And it reflects on Norm the man, not just the racing man. I would like you to join me in thanking one of the finest speakers we've had here at the Sporting Car Club, Norm Beachy. Thank you. selling some uh, raffle tickets. I think. I'm not too sure how many prizes are there, but I think we'll get all, all the uh, tickets out of the pen. Thank you.
Yeah, well, I think all the people will be gone there, Paul. Not the ones that want to stay. Yeah. Right, so the people that are going to receive something will stay, they seem to know that. Okay, this section of the meeting I declare, declare closed. Uh, and thank you all for coming. There is a supper. Little parties and parties, they'll be coming out in a moment. Thank you very much for attending.